Okay. So, my name is, uh, I go by Keith Baker. My dad didn't want another Oliver. He didn't want a junior, so he called him Keith instead of Walter. And this is the book launch. And the book title is Quantum Entanglement in High Energy Physics. Now, you probably want to know where the title came from. Intech Open gave me uh, the responsibility to choose the title that I want. And this is for, and, and as we go further into this, I hope you'll see why I chose this over what they wanted. But anyway, um, this book launch now. Okay, so I chose the publisher Intech Open. Intech Open is the world's leading publisher of open access books. And in addition to that, there are other things that are going to come up a little later, but they were put into place here by scientists for scientists. This was made for people like, I would say, perhaps to some level, all of us, but especially me, okay, about having an open access book here, and lots of them. So I wanted to point out now that Yale is a part of this, this collaboration of people with all of these books. Okay, so um, this, this was edited by me. And what does that mean? I had the responsibility where I could contact people to send their book chapters uh, to Intake Open, and then Intake Open would send them to me. And those people would not be charged any, um, they would not be charged for, for uh, writing a book chapter and submitting it. But in, on the other hand, also, Intake Open had the responsibility to, con uh, to just let people know that they were accepting these kind of book chapters, and they did. So what I wanted to point out here is I edited, whenever Intake Open got a new book chapter, they sent it to me. I had to read it. I had to check to make sure that the calculations were right. I had to make sure that the, the wording was right. I also had to see, was it original? I had to see um, where it came from and so forth and so on. I want you to know that um, I, I actually enjoyed it as I got into it, as, as, and I'll point this out to you. So, the one thing I want to start with is the following um, from our uh, publishing process manager. Um, Nina is her name, and she was just fantastic. Anytime that I slipped on something and maybe I was a day late on something like that, she took care of it. And she also was one who just did not make a big deal out of uh, whenever there were mistakes. She was just fantastic. So if you find yourself, getting involved with Intake Open, you should contact her. All right, there were 14 chapters in this book. One of them my own, but there were 13 others. And anyway, so 900, so of those 14 chapters, 946 downloads were taken. So, um, beginning in October, that was when this book publication was made. And then I got the email from her sometime in June, as I recall. So 946 chapter downloads, and nearly 60 downloads per week. This was something that um, they at Intech Open really felt strong about. And they wanted this to be publicized. And I told them, I'm not going to go around the world giving this talk, right? It has to go at one place and it's here. So this, the, as a, uh, uh, the email said, this clearly demonstrates the strong interest your work has generated within the academic community, and I believe this number will only continue to grow. Okay. So, now, why did I choose the topic that I did? Why did I choose it? The reason is that quantum entanglement has been around for a while, but from what I could tell, most of it was in um, the realm of atomic, molecular, and optical physics. They are the ones that show quantum, and king, uh, quantum entanglement existence and how it works and so forth and so on. Now, there also came to be this disagreement 
sort of, between Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and Rutherford, and others, about whether there were hidden variables. The, uh, the argument was that it wasn't just quantum mechanics that allowed us to uh, tell what was going on in, with atoms and molecules and all of that, and with and in nuclear and in particle physics. Uh, what had to happen was that this quantity, which called, which ultimately we call Bell's inequality, the parameter that uh, was given to for us to measure and determine whether Bell's inequality was violated or not was that quantity. And in every single experiment in AMO physics and uh, nuclear and in particle physics, um, the Bell inequality uh, is violated, which is what you want, because when it's violated, it means that quantum mechanics is correct. That is what we use, and that's what we're supposed, we're supposed to use. Einstein didn't like it because, in some ways, it showed that cause and effect can swap with each other. But we know that in special relativity and in our world, that's not the case. You have to have um, uh, uh, an effect and a cause that are different. And so if there was this hidden variables, that's what would happen. If, if the Bell inequality was found to be true, then we'd have to do something to understand what we're doing in particle physics, nuclear physics, and animal physics without just using quantum mechanics. So that's why I got into this because of the LHC. We were now going to high energies, and I'll come back to this later. The point there is that with high energies now and high masses, you'll have, you'll have different, <laughs> Um, in special relativity, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. And instead of standing and telling too, many, too much, but just in, uh, in on this particular slide, the reason that I chose the title that I did was for the same reasons that some of these other authors put into the book chapters after I had already put that chapter on it. They sent books and they knew in advance just what I thought that. The majority of current understanding of the quantum correlation is in the field of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. This is in atomic, molecular, and optical physics as an example. The force carrier in that are photons. They have zero mass. And in these experiments that were done, for example, they might have had other problems there, and I'll show them to you. There were more about these as well, and I won't go through them for lack of time here. But I wanted to point out just one example. This is a, a paper that was published in a series of letters by Alan Aspect. And you probably already know that he won the Nobel Prize. He and his colleagues were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2022 on this, this very uh, experiment. They had this is the source. And in this source, you had an atom that decayed into photons. The photons, these slits made them go along a certain path, uh, you know, directly along a certain path. Now, they had to uh, go, they could either, they go through this polarizer here and this polarizer here. They could be parallel to each other. They can be perpendicular to each other. You can have both of them parallel, for example, and they come down to the coincidence or one of them is parallel and one of them is perpendicular and they go down to these singles. These are, uh, this this is the equipment that um, you know, gathers them and tells you what it is that happened. So what Alan Essig did was he look he's a great guy. I'm not going against what he did. He when he came here um, he visited before he got the Nobel Prize, and I actually had a coffee with him, and uh, he was happy to learn about moving this to high energies. And in fact. Um, I made, I kept making the statement that I'm just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. You've already pointed this out. He said, no, that's not true. This may be something that's new, that's different at the collider energies. And that's what made me want to go in that direction. And this is what collider energies look like, collider energy experiments look like. This is the detector and a collider. And here are two people 
and here's a person and here's a person. This is a large uh, uh, gathering of detectors, okay? And you might not believe this, but uh, we're told that even if you put this out in the middle of the ocean, it'll float, okay? It looks big, but it's uh, the way it's built is like that. Okay, so when protons come in like this and this, they collide at the middle of this uh, spectrometer, or this detector, and this is what happens. They smash into each other and all kinds of things come out because the, in, the atomic molecular and optical physics experiments were at electron volt energies and a few maybe electron volt um, uh, energies or something like that. This is different. These are at trillions of electron volts. That's where the collision takes place. And the force carriers that come out of this, if we make a Higgs boson, the force carriers that come out of that are millions to billions of electron volts in mass. And they move at those same kind of energies. They move at high, very high energies, billions of, of, of electron volts under certain, certain circumstances. And you get this lot of collisions per second and so forth and so on. You can read this book and get all of it. Now, let's look at the book itself. Of these chapters, you can ignore this one. This introductory chapter is just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There, there, okay, there are some good parts of that. <laughs> Um, what I liked about this was follows. These, these people who, who submitted these book chapters, they were really good. I read them. I was up until three o'clock in the morning, right, Loretta? And, or sometime, you know. <laughs> and all of them, and I had a deadline for each of them. Each of these are just outstanding universities for what it is that they do in this regard. I looked them up as well. So I wanted to point out, especially this one, on the questions of spin and spin quantum correlations, so forth and so on. And this one, why is there a contradiction between special relativity and quantum entanglement, where you can't have a uh, causality has to be held, and yet for some reason, it looks like it may not be held in some, uh, in some conditions. So this now, this is what I wanted also to emphasize. Like you, I studied physics. That's where, that's where I put all of my attention and everything, right? But as it turns out, there, there's more to it than that. If you want to include, for example, uh, um, something that's other than physics, there could be mathematics, there could be agriculture, medicine, uh, uh, um, and Let's see, what was the other one? Um, I forgot what it was anyway. But all of these now, quantum entanglement has some access to them. And this is the thing that really got to me because I, I hadn't expected this to come from Intech Open. Um, for example, Chris Timpson here, he's a philosopher. He's a philosopher, he's at Oxford, he's brilliant. I was at Oxford for a workshop a year ago, let's see. Mira, are you here? When did we go? <laughs> <laughs> it was a year? In March 2022. 2022, okay. So we were there two years ago. He's a brilliant guy, and I spoke with him and talked with him, and he was just great. There's another one from um, Karen. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but she is a social scientist. She's not a physicist. And she wrote a book. these two were two of the best chapters in the, in the entire book. I wrote to Intake Open and said, you have to put these in, even if they're not physics-led, uh, let's call them, uh, chapters. And they were, and, and they really jumped on this. So, and, and so there were uh, three different kinds of uh, book chapters. There were the theor theoretical chapters, those that are interdisciplinary and those that are experiment, experiment chapters. Okay, so uh, those are the chapters that led up to you know, Now, I want to put special attention on chapter four because this is the one where there was competition between special relativity and quantum entanglement. 
And in experiments, here's the thing, I'll try to move rather quickly. In these experiments, you can have, um, uh, what was it? Uh, sorry. But entangled pairs, yeah. And entangled pairs of photons. They were entangled, but there was more than one of them. So in these, in some experiments you can have where event one is the cause of event two, while the other one claims that event one is the result of event two. And as it points out, this solution suggests the paradox. Uh, the solution we suggest to the paradox is that in entangled systems, one can find pairs of entangled events which have symmetrical causality relations. One can be cause and the other effect, and the other can be uh, uh, cause and the other effect. That is possible here, and it's shown in some of the references that are in this book chapter. So if you want to get this book and read it, you should. Now, uh, and what this is saying is simply the same thing. You can have pairs of entangled events, not just entangled particles, entangled events. Okay, and the experimental, experimental results, and you can go to these references and look at them, can be interpreted as supporting this suggestion. That says that there are experiments that can support this. All right, so um, I wanted to just point out that this interdisciplinary work that was done, this is what really got to me because I'm just used to just focusing on the physics descent, not, not everything else. Okay, but this actually did cause a difference in my thinking, in critical thinking, and opening my mind in some cases to different points of view. There was a there was a book chapter that was sent that was interdisciplinary. And I won't go in, into that because uh, into detail, but uh, they they sent a uh, a book chapter, and that book chapter uh, it. I felt that it wasn't original. It was a great chapter, but it wasn't original. So I told them to take open that. And they sent that information to that, um, that editor, I'm sorry, that author. And they withdrew their book chapter. And I sent an email to them saying, no, I don't want you to withdraw it. I just wanted to answer the question that Intake Open asked me to answer it. Is it original or not? Was there any other paper that had something like this done? <laughs> and the answer is, um, I hope, Steve Lamoro, that you don't jump up and punch me in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I uh, met with Steve and said, Steve, you know, what is it that I did? He was the one that pointed it out. I'll leave it at that. And as it turns out, they, uh, that person uh, sent me an email back saying, okay. And that person had gone to their dean at their university and had, um, the dean made a response to that, that, you know, somehow or another, I had not done it right. But the dean was uh, in many ways on my side because the email that was sent they got sent to me and it was like, look, he's a STEM scientist. That's how they do it. You're just going to have to deal with it. You know, that's how it goes. And it went. And, and that book chapter got published. It was uh, wonderful. So this is something that I wanted to point out to you, that uh, this interdisciplinary uh, nature doesn't exclude, uh, does not e exclude quantum entanglement. It's part of it. You can, you can use it. That's what we, that's what I got from this. And then there were these other experiments. Uh, this is one, but I'll leave it where it's an experiment. They go through the experiment that was done. In, in, again, non-relativistic formula, the formulation and the relativistic formulation. And this is why we need to do this at the library. Okay. Now, toward the end, I'll make this point. Uh, Yale University seems to enjoy this. Uh, Steve Lamb and some others here will probably go with this. So um, this was from our vice provost for research, Michael Crayer, about we are making huge investments into our infrastructure for quantum research, primarily with the new physical science and engineering building that will continue to transform science Hill. And you can read this uh, by going to this site if you want to. 
So this is a big deal. And this is intake open. I wanted to end on this intake open. These are, there are a lot of authors and academic editors. I was the academic editor for the book on quantum entanglement and physics. I also, this Nobel laureate, I worked with him briefly uh, some years ago before coming to Yale. So I just wanted to make the point now that the authors range from established Nobel laureates to some of the most talented up and coming researchers worldwide, cutting in the scientific discovery, contributes to our mission and joint contribute to our mission, they're asking, and join us at the forefront of our shared scientific journey. Okay, so I wanted to